They come from these what we call Indian trade textiles, and these were, you know, the equivalent of Chinese, like Chinese porcelain. They were traded all over Southeast Asia, right to Japan, and of course to Europe. But in the 15th century, it was mainly to um, what they call Maritime Asia, the Malay Archipelago, basically the Indonesian islands. And the earliest examples have been carbon dated to the 13th century, um, but the examples we're showing here date to the, the earliest, like a piece like this from the 16th century. Um, textile and Indian cotton was already commercialized. So an example like this was block printed and repeated and you had the option of cutting them for shawls or for ceremonial purposes or in some communities they, they literally kept the whole length. Um, basically, for the early cloths, you had the, the colors of blue and red, blue from indigo, and red from uh, the madder plant. And um, these were the only two that were color fast, and the Indians had the secret to producing color fast dyes and cotton. And it was not till the late 18th century that the secret was discovered and copied in Europe. And uh, the European production caused the decline of the Indian textile trade. But basically, the Indian in, in Gujarat and what we call the Coromandel Coast, which is sort of South India, uh, Southeast Coast of India, um, had the control of this trade for you know, half, more than half a century. Um, what I want to show here are these geometric patterns and these figurative patterns. Um, these were sort of the, the kind of styles that were around the sort of 16th, 15th, 16th, 16th, 17th century. What about this pattern? This is something you can Yeah, the, well, these, this is what they call the dancing lady pattern. Um, the earliest example of this is in the uh, ACM collection. And th they carbon dated that one to the 13th century. They, they're, they're very, very old cloths. The interesting thing about Indian textiles, not much was known about this for, for quite a long time. And in the 80s, they even published a book on little fragments found in Egypt. Um, and which they carbon dated, you know, and they published a big book on it. And then suddenly, I think in the, in the 80s, they were finding that, um, you know, sari lengths of them were kept in all the kampung communities all over the Indonesian islands. And basically, they were they were uh, luxury cloths that were bartered for pep for the spices uh, for Europe. Through the, the early traders of these were. Arab and Indian merchants and then the Portuguese came and took over the trade uh, up to the 17th century and then from the 17th to 19th century it was the Dutch. So these examples here are from uh, sort of from the Dutch period um, and by the 18th century it was, it was really quite interesting because um, they produced cloths for specific markets so you see European sort of inspired designs, Mughal designs, Chinese designs were all thrown in together. Basically, Indian textile production and patterns was pretty much globalized by the 18th century. Um, again, complex geometric patterns, sort of a more naturalistic floral gold patterns, and then a lot of imitation woven patterns or imitation patchwork. Here we have an early example of uh, sarong. So one of the key things that, uh, well, especially in contemporary English, that is sort of forgotten is that the sarong is officially a tube that has to be sewn up and then wrapped over the body. Because now a sarong is anything you, you wrap around your waist, but it has to be a tube. That's the official, the Malay word for 
a sheet or so forth, outer wrapping. And uh, we know that the sarong because of the, the holes, the, the seam holes. And um, this is a late 18th century example. Um, and it's interesting because it's the same format as to the kind of later batik sarong, with the, what we call the kapala of the head in the middle. And this we call the tumpal of which is a uh, sawtooth edge and then a geometric pattern of the side. And this section is on the front. Uh, then we move here to garment types. And basically there are two shapes that we look at. One is called the baju and one is called the kabaya. When we look at these um, ancient records, of, of the word baju is, is of Islamic origin. We're not sure if it's Persian or Turkish. But by, definitely by the 16th century, it was worn all over the Indian Ocean. The word um, known throughout, uh, in, in the languages of, uh, of uh, it entered the language of uh, many communities all over the uh, Indian Ocean. And it's characterized by this B-shaped keyhole that you put your head through. Of course, we know this now as the Bajukurong, um, worn by the Malay community and in Sumatra. This example is from Sumatra and interestingly it uh, is made of European printed cotton which is made in imitation of the Indian uh, textile. Uh, Indian European cotton was commercialized and machine made by the late 18th century and it brought the prices down and basically killed off the Indian textile trade. The other the other garment form is what we call the kabaya, and this comes from, again, probably a Persian or Arab rope called the kaba, Q-A-B-A, and it was a long open rope. It's characterized by this sort of a two elements, a kind of a seam, which I think is, uh, in Malay you call it pesa, uh, and then what we call an arm gusset, which they call a keke. And these are characteristics of Islamic garments. The other element is uh, the fact that there are no shoulder seam. The cloth is just one piece front to back. Um, kabayas are also worn in many, many communities in India, uh, in the Islamic world, and in the Malay Archipelago. And as I said, also added the vocabularies of so many communities. Um, here, and the these are made from Indian cottons also. Um, in some cases, you see very interesting that the, the, the during the dust, by the 18th century, some some kabayas were made with uh, European baroque patterns. Sometimes you see Chinese patterns, and uh, you find them all over from Europe. These these, these kinds of cloths you see in Holland. They went to America, and in kampongs in Sumatra, and. Actually, they were even in the big towns, but of course, in the big cities, the people wore them and washed them and strewed them away. And in the smaller communities, these were preserved more as heirlooms. I would use the example of uh, how you go to a little town anywhere and you see pristine vintage cars that are still driven like new. And I, I think this sort of attitude to, to things that's preserved in small communities. Here you have this incredible, uh, also uh, in this period, Baju and Kabaya were worn by both men and women. And by the 16th century in the colonial period, you also have uh, Eurasian women in Goa, in Batavia, wearing these kinds of garments. But this example here is, a, is worn by a Kampong chief from Lampong, which is in South Sumatra. Um, and Lampong was under the cultural influence of Banten, which is in East Java. And in, in, for the Javanese, the patchwork had a very symbolic and uh, protective sort of power. They were worn as sort of a talismanic coat. Um, and this is made from an incredible uh, array of in, uh, Indian textiles that, that, um, and the trade, global trade and the cloth. There are also fragments of English wool, Indian brocades, some very early Javanese batik. Um, there were Czech cloths from Java, Sulawesi, the Bugis cloth. So um, it's, it's, it's a whole inventory or encyclopedia of 18th century cloth. Um, and in the classic 
Kebaya Sheikh. So, so it yeah. was owned by the village chief. Yeah, in, in South Lampung, South, uh, in South Sumatra, South Sumatra. Lampung, South Sumatra. May I add that this is also one of the highlights of the exhibition and definitely the highlight of uh, Peter's family, the generous uh, donation uh, to the museum. And um, I think he's going to show one more piece um, that we have borrowed, an um, incredible piece from one of the Dutch museums. Uh, but generally the area that we have just walked through, uh, to clarify, uh, yes, they were not worn by the Pranikans, but all the, the designs that you see, as well as the garment shapes that, uh, that has been presented, the baju, um, and the kabaya, these are garment forms that is what the Pranakan uh, ladies are wore later. So, um, yeah. so Peter will show you the last piece. So, uh, this, is, this is an interesting, we borrowed this from Holland. This is a, a Dutch Eurasian ladies kabaya. You can see it's exactly the same um, construction with the, the, the lapel, but with added buttons. It's made of a uh, Bengal muslin, but with fine Indian style embroidery and metal threads. Yeah. So what basically we're just showing the sort of historical background to the garment shapes. <coughs> so we come now to the next section which we call um, Slave Girl to Heiress. Uh, and this is uh, again also to take the Pranakans out of the comfort zone because of, co of course you know that uh, you must have heard the, there are some myths to the origins of the Pranakan community meaning some Princess Hang Li Po going to Malacca to marry the Sultan of Malacca and uh, starting the sort of a mixed race community but when we look back to Dutch uh, colonial records it seems quite evident that the early Chinese traders in the 17th and 18th century um, often had slave girls as their spouses. So they freed slave women. And the slave women were, I mean, slave trade was very rife at that period. And the, the slaves came, many of them were from Bali and Sumatra, like from Batak. Um, and, 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 you know, it was really brutal. They would just go on shore and grab a whole lot of people and just cut them off to, you know, Batavia on Laka for sale. And so the early, uh, quite often you see the, the spouses of the Pranakas being described as the free slave, Bali slave, so and so, um, or the, the mother of Nonia, so and so, the Balinese, so and so. So we, we know that uh, quite often these were the first mothers. Um, the, the Pranakans were described as wearing kabayas in the 18th century, but none actually survived. So the f earliest ones we have are from the third quarter of the 19th century, so fairly late. But you can see, clearly see from the way the garment is cut, it, it's exactly the same as the early kabayas we have there. So uh, with the, what we call the sort of lapel and the gussets, and they were either made check rock or with these batik stamps, small hand stamp batik from. Um, by the 19th century, the Europeans had so to taken over <coughs> the, the textile, globally the textile trade, so these were already machines made with cotton and uh, dyed in Java for the straight <coughs> market. And the other interesting thing was the whole trade in the check cloth. Uh, the old check cloths, of course, some were hand woven in the islands, in the Black Archipelago. <coughs> they could have also come from Yangon, from India, or even like this example is the machine, machine woven version from Europe. So um, the sources for the early Nonya costumes were already pretty international. It was by a European or Eurasian woman? Any Dutch colony is she prominent or? Uh, but they had wealthy women, the, the, the wives of high ranking civil servants or governors or in the Dutch towns of Batavia, in Sri Lanka, and South India, there were all these pockets of uh, colonial towns that the Dutch had. And of course, the Dutch women were totally localized. 
um, they were their, their mothers or their grandmothers were also sometimes uh, concubines or feet, slave girls, sometimes Portuguese Eurasians. So they, they mostly could not speak Dutch. And in terms of their behavior and all that, they were like everybody else. You know, they were eating seaway. They had the food was all very localized. So even in, for example, in Batavia, um, the Dutch women were like this. You visiting Europeans were quite shocked because they, they, they were not European in their behavior. Is there any difference between the one that one way? Um, Dutch. And interestingly, yeah. you know, with they. Because, you know, in, in this period, the, I mean, you know, conceptually, the Dutch were the, the emperors of the, the archipelago. So, I suppose, in a way, they were also the, the trendsetters. So, in terms of not only costume, but if you find in silver work, um, they were the ones who were making a lot of cross-cultural objects. That, and, then, and then, through that way, the fashion spread, or they may have been influenced by something, and then and then they dress nicely and some other community. So you can but differentiate the, the, the types of kabaya they wear? Actually, yeah, you, you can make general observations, but also I would be careful not to sort of... I mean, the, I mean, the one with the high class and the lower class kabaya, you can differentiate Oh yeah, because of the quality of the material. Yeah. Because, for example, you know, basically any kind of hand-painted cloth, because these were done with hand, mm -hmm. uh, were expensive. So it's like this because they were kept in heirloom objects that survived. So by the 1870s, we see, we see from the earliest photographs that um, batik production uh, caught up with the drop of the Indian, the loss from the Indian trade. And I think in the Malay world, there was a very deep appreciation for hand drawn batik or hand drawn painted cloth. So Although printed, cheap printed cloth came in, they could not replace this demand for hand cloth, hand drawn cloth. And, and so slowly you find um, the production increase from, in Singapore for example, in the early 19th century, you don't see any, uh, you see in the list of imports from the old newspapers, it's all uh, batik handkerchief and selendang on the shop. Uh, no description of batik sarong. Lots of uh, but imitation batik sarongs from Europe. Uh, funnily enough, they were they were flooding the market, and um, but we only in the second half of the 19th century, with European-made factory cotton, that the batik industry was able to uh, mount, uh, produce much more. So we see from this period, from the Czech cloth, they progressed to these uh, early uh, batiks from the 1860s made in Chinese workshops, the main centers for batik production was Samarang and Lhasa uh, for the north coast and for the kind of Pranakan market. And they were mostly geometric. You, you never see them wear flowery ones at all. And these reflect back to the early pieces. You see all of them have a complex geometrical pattern. But still with these very conservative uh, margins. I also noted that some people walking through that they're really shapeless. That they were worn in this really oversized way, and because there were no shoulder seams, they were rather ill-fitting, and you you get this really bunched up look at the shoulders. Mm -hmm. And when you see the old photos, and even if you go downstairs in the other galleries, you see all of them there the more crunched up like this. Um, Would they have been worn with the coat? Yes. Um, sometimes. In the early period, actually, they, they were designed as an open row, so they didn't have these pins. Uh, but the Nonia um, used very small pins. And then, of course, the jewelry story is completely separate and not to the jewelry, but they, they got bigger as the decades grew. Um, then we move on to the 20th century. And here we have uh, examples from Penang. The Penang bridal versions of the. Oh, the other thing I forgot to mention in in Malacca, the kabaya was known by the Malay community, the Pranakan community, as the baju panjang. But when we see contemporary records from the Dutch period, the Dutch call them kabayas. 
So actually that's the same word, the Kabaya and the Bajupanjang, just different terminology from different communities. So of course we Pranakans know this as Bajupanjang, which is long road. And um, in Penang, the Chinese businessmen there, Pranakan business, found wives in Malacca and the costume moved to Penang for the ladies. And then what happened was in in Yangon and in Phuket, businessmen there found rights in Penang. So the costume spread. This example, for example, this for example was found in uh, sourced in Yangon, belonging to the Pranakan Museum. And this one also Pranakan Museum from uh, Penang. And these brocade versions, the, the brocade came from Europe, from China, uh, were made, uh, were worn just in Penang, like a Yangon. Uh, Penang, Phuket and Yangon, not in uh, Singapore and Malacca. And interestingly, they were paired with uh, Songket sarongs, which were made in Sumatra or in Malay Peninsula or Riau. In Yangon, they wore them with batik sarongs, which they bought in Penang. So, and here we have a rather curious, interesting example, worn in Penang, with uh, Chinese gold thread embroidery rabbit fur and paired with the socket sarong and I think this is really a hybrid of Chinese Islamic shape Melayu uh, socket uh, totally totally a cocktail of style then the end section is uh, the development in the early 20th century of the Baju Panja of course uh, by the 1880s in Singapore a lot of European cloth was imported, so these are European organdies uh, from about 1900-1910s, paired with uh, these sarongs. And batik industry was always slower to respond to global trends, so um, chemical dyes allowed colours and costumes to be much, much brighter. But uh, the sarongs are still the natural dyes up to the 1910s, so the Nonias paired them with these red and similarly red and blue, like you see right from the the Indian trade cloth, but the other three behind are from the 1930s, and by then the chemical chemical dyes from Germany had had, had gone into the batik industry in Java, and then you see much more brightly hued sarongs in in, in bright colours uh, from the 1920s and 30s. So this is sort of the trend for the batik. And by the 50s, I would say only old ladies wore this. Okay. And just a little thing about the uh, this corner, we have uh, a little introduction to the batik Chinese workshops in Java, Chinese batik workshops in Java. Um, the Chinese Peranakan community has been producing batik in Java at least since the late 18th century, and this we know from Dutch. From, from colonial records, colonial period records. Um, and in Java, the, the, in the streets, the, the, the Nonyas only wore what we call the Baju Panjang, but in Java, the ladies wore this, the, the Baju, or the Baju Kuro, which they paired with the uh, batiks made in the Chinese workshops there. And here you can see the engagement with the, the Malay world, and really hybrid garment. You still see these ancient tumpal or puchuk dubum patterns, but then you have uh, banji or swastika motifs, uh, cloud patterns, and sort of a, a very hybrid design as well. And on the top, this is the late 19th century example, but uh, I would say because of the huge amounts of commercially and machine printed cotton that were so perfectly designed, batik production also became very, very precise and carefully drawn and almost perfectly drawn and uh, these really you know fine examples were produced for very wealthy clients Chinese clients in Java a piece like this with what they call gold leaf or Prada was made for the wedding um, also to point out also in a lot of Pranakan contempt modern Pranakan perception black was never used for, except for mourning but when we look at these early examples it's totally not true um, there was very little color coding in the early period um, because there were only red. There's only a choice of red, blue, and black to wear. So you, you know, if you if you don't want to wear red, you can't 
you, you didn't have many color choices. So you can see that this is not a morning, even from a photograph here of a Pranakan lady in Java wearing a baju kurong. Um, it was just a plain dark.